everybody for uh, coming out tonight, the Siegel team, everybody, Salma, Michael, Brian, everybody involved, you Chen, and of course, uh, Karen Melpete, who we're celebrating today. And um, here at Siegel, we also have a publication line, the Martin Siegel Center Publications, and we know how much work really goes into uh, making a book, but this is just making the book. But uh, think about writing and doing the plays and uh, creating them and then putting them again together, choosing them. And this is um, what she did. It's a great, great achievement, I think. As was once a Jackie Onassis or Kennedy who said, if you just do one book in your life, mm -hmm. your life is full of meaning. Mm -hmm. And um, you did uh, so much more already, so we really have the highest respect for your work, also for the context, uh, what you put in, what you think about theater, what theater should do, how disconnected, what impact it can have. So we are I'm honored to have you here tonight. And Karen didn't come along tonight. She came with all her uh, friends, with her family, as we said today, of collaborators over many years. We have a great uh, panel who um, will come here uh, together. The format of the evening will be uh, excerpts of three plays, once also a short video after each of the plays. Four plays will be a short uh, back and forth with one correspondence here on the chair. Then we will all sit together, everybody uh, who talked about the individual play for a little panel discussion, and then we open it up uh, very soon and fast to everybody here in the audience, because we have a great audience and we take pride of it. And so there will be really a back and forth, followed by a little reception here, and then we go to the archive uh, bar. We also have the book out here. It took a really a long time to put this together. It just came out, and instead of 30 or 35 dollars, just 20 tonight, so uh, please do support also the book, but also Karen with the work. Um, I think it is really uh, worth it. And there are the four books, uh, four plays we're going to hear tonight from our all um, in here. The Siegel Center Bridges Academia and Professional Theater, International and American Theater. And many of you also have been here. George has been here, and Catherine has been here, and so many of you, Cindy, Marvin, and everybody um, involved. So um, it is, uh, we are, I think, part of a New York community of a family investing. So it's a uh, a really a good reason to come together and celebrate life, work, and as Buddhists say, uh, joyful participation in the sorrows of life. And mm -hmm. I think this is also what Karen's plays um, are about. So uh, Karen, maybe a few words before we start? Uh, <clears throat> very few, really, to thank. Uh, there are seven essays in this book that accompany each play. 
Uh, Kristen Clifford wrote one. Cindy Rosenthal wrote the afterword. Marvin Carlson wrote the foreword. Uh, Alexander Schlutz wrote the essay about extreme weather. Naja Saeed, who's not here tonight, wrote the essay about prophecy. Uh, Rebecca Gordon, the wonderful political writer, wrote the essay about the anti-torture play, Another Life. Um, and then I wrote a preface. Uh, so it really is a collective effort. The photographs by uh, Beatrice um, Schiller, who has taken all our, all our plays except Prophecy, unfortunately, she was out of town uh, for 22 <laughs> years. Uh, Sally Ann Parsons, who's designed all the costumes, Tony Giovanetti, who's designed all the lights. Uh, all of their work uh, is in the book um, and in the photos. Alex Tavis, who's in two of the productions. Um, Luba Lukova, who's done all of our posters for 22 years, um, which you see on the, on the so this is a, uh, this is an amazing effort of a tiny little theater that uh, keeps chugging along, partly, mainly because of George Bartenev, who keeps pushing me up the hill. Uh, so, uh, so thank you all, and thank you for coming, and thank you, Frank, for having us. Thank you. And before we start, if a few people start, or maybe do take out your cell phones, I'll do the same. And um, should we take pictures off, ring us, <laughs> ring us off, yes. Uh, you, you go with a camera, with flash on yeah. stage. So Children. just to set up Beekeeper's daughter, George, uh, George and Kristen, <coughs> excuse me, were in the original production 25 years ago in uh, <coughs> at Lee Nagrin's studio and Cindy saw it. She was very pregnant um, with a now grown daughter. Uh, and then we revived the play uh, last year in 2016. Um, they're going to do uh, a speech of, jo of Robert, who's the poet. He encounters Admira, who is a woman from Bosnia who has been raped and forcibly impregnated and brought to his house by his daughter, Rachel. She's up in the middle of the night, wandering, very pregnant, and Robert, who's going outside to take photos of his lover, uh, runs into her, and this is the speech. I'm very sorry. I, I, I promise you, I won't come near you. It was a very beautiful picture. I'll give it to you. You at the window, in the moonlight. Can you understand what I say? I saw a luminous light in your eyes, as if you were looking far away into some other time or place. That's why I snapped a shot. The shutter without thinking, I'm sorry, I won't do such a thing again. You truly are safe here. No one will hurt you. Maybe it was the moon, but I don't think so. I think your eyes were sparkling for a moment. <laughs> it's odd, isn't it? That in Western art, we have no, we have no picture or depiction of pregnant women until we come to the 15th century pregnant Madonna of Piero della Francesca, and she was the victim of immaculate conception. <laughs> she seems completely perplexed by her situation. Of course, we assume that in her case, the whole process was fairly gentle. <laughs> we have to, have to think that, don't we? My point is, even the mother of Christ didn't choose her own fate. How few women actually do. Maybe that's the difference between men and women. Men think they're free. Women don't even bother to pretend. Oh. I mean, surely Mary didn't ask to become the mother of a god 
when I say a God, not God, you know, this I <laughs> am what you might call a pagan. I really am a believer in multiple gods. How can one not be? After all, look at the violence unleashed by the endless fights over which god is the best. We really have to learn to accept the divine spirit is born all the time to mortal women, and we never know. Actually, in classical mythology, most gods were born to mortal women by an act of rape. In that case, uh, in that sense, I suppose, immaculate conception is a forward step. <laughs> Indeed, the phrase is not merely a cover-up. But perhaps there is no way that a divine spirit could enter our present world, except as a result of incredible force. Oh, does that sound too much like uh, justification? I don't intend that. No, it's just that for every extreme action, there's also an extreme reaction. And for all of us in the end, the same question remains. How much do we let uh, outside events uh, uh, create us? And how much do we hold ourselves responsible for what we become? In your case, the question poses itself at the very edge of tolerance. Still, I would hesitate to say you don't bear some responsibility for what you could become. Uh, not for what has happened to you, of which obviously you are very co completely innocent, but for what, despite everything, you might still imagine yourself to be. So, so uh, I wrote um, Prophecy for Kathleen Shelfont and then had the great pleasure of having her do the part um, and the greater pleasure of becoming her friend for all these many years and so here she is. Uh, she's going to do a speech from Prophecy and then uh, Caitlin uh, Cassidy will join her to do a scene from prophecy. Uh, I think they're self-explanatory, yes? <laughs> Go. Oh, stay here on this rug. Stewed in corruption. <laughs> in the steamy stink of your love. I bought this rug. I picked it out so we could start fresh, white. The other, other rug, the red one, where Lucas and I slept, I rolled up and stored in the basement because I cannot bear to throw it out. The night we protested the secret invasion of Cambodia, the night we thought the war would never end, I pulled Lucas off the street. I was forever pulling Lucas away from the police. He was always aching for a fight. I brought him up here. It was a collective apartment then. Below on the street, there was tear gas. Lucas told me he'd flunked all of his classes except one in English composition. I gave him an A. Go to Canada, he said, to avoid the draft. Or join the weatherman and become a real revolutionary. Go to Canada, I told him. Please, I'll come to you there. I leaned down to taste him again. When finally we finished, when he lay beside me on the red rug and I cradled him in my arms, he smiled and said he figured out what he should do. He would leave school and get himself drafted. He would join the GI resistance and organize from the inside. 
He sat up. He saw his destiny plain. When the army refuses to fight, the war will end. Don't be an asshole, I said. <laughs> Kiss me, he said. I want your child, Lucas, but I couldn't say that to him. Don't be a hero, I said. You know how long those guys live in the jungle. I'm working class, he said. Those are my men. Stay here. You can make up your failing grades. I'll talk to the dean. We lived in our grief. Legs looped, sex linked. It's OK, Lucas said. Whatever happens to me, it'll be fine. There's no time for personal happiness now. He learned to talk that way at Columbia. <laughs> Little kids are being napalm. This shit has to stop. I'll give up Alan for you. I'll call him in Cambridge right now. I reach for the phone. But Lucas was only 19. He was more frightened of me than of Vietnam. Hmm. Oh, sure. Holla? Holla, yes. It's Sarah. Sarah? Alan's, you know. Oh, Sarah, hello. hello. How, how, how are, are you? you? You're well? Yeah, as usual, and, and you? I'm fine. You are? I am, yes. I'm glad. I'm glad you're all right. Mariam's in New York. Oh, I sent her out of England. I, I sent her out of here to England. I had no idea that she... She's a wonderful young woman. Amazing, really. I'm glad you think so. I do. She's ballsy, if you know what I mean. I do. <laughs> I don't want to speak to Alan. Alan's asleep. Holla? Yes, Sarah, what? Something's happened. Not to Mariam, she's fine. Really. Lovely. Has she taken off the headscarf in New York? Tell me yes. Oh, she started that at boarding school in England, not in Beirut. Here she was disco dancing. Here I worried about sex, drinking, usual things. Now who knows what to fear? The young are putting on the scarves. Oh my god, if my mother were alive, she would have. Something's been. happened. I'll uh, there's someone else. To me, too, I think. I couldn't sleep. I haven't been sleeping. I know. Is. I, you do. I don't sleep. Oh, my God, of course not. I'm, what can I say? Well, the bombing has stopped. The truce might hold. I hope so. We are relieved. Hala, I have something in my head. A woman. I had to tell someone. You, I thought. Hala, I could tell you've been to Iraq. I was there, yes. At the start. Afterwards, there was no room for the UN. How can such things happen, this war? I mean, we let it, not you. We, here, and now, well, I teach. You remember, do you? a talented young man in my class. She was pregnant, Paula. I, I don't know what I'm asking. He can't forget. That's good. I think he shouldn't. But now, I mean, I know. I see. It's an indelible image, really. I don't know. What do you do? Do. With such things. With the things you've heard. Th things you've seen, I mean. How do you? Go on. <clears throat> I suppose. I don't know. You go on, obviously you do. 
but it's in my mind like a scene in a play. I didn't see it firsthand like you, like, like I suppose you've seen, and worse things. Still, I can't forget. I cannot stop looking. Sometimes I feel I'm her. I see. You do. Because I'm afraid I'm completely unhinged. There's um, a concept the therapists have secondary traumatization. It happens from the things you hear, things that people tell you, they tell you, and you see it all in front of you. You take their story into your body. It happens to everyone, everyone who listens, that is. Is what you wanted to hear? What do you do? do? <laughs> yes, Hala, please. You weep with them. You hold them if you can, if they let you. If they are not so stiff, they can't be touched. You try to hold them until you hold them until they can start to shake. You want to know this. I know this, yes. Sometimes they bury their head in your lap. Even if they are men, sometimes, often, if a wife has been killed, they cry. Or if they're children, Grown men, they tremble in your arms. They are not home. They were not home when the house was bombed. They come home. Everyone they love is gone. They dig. They find a hand, maybe. I can't tell you, Sarah, I will not do it. Not over the phone, not in your west side apartment with all those white walls. But I know, I mean, I read, I watch the news, we do see, but please, it's this boy I had. He was a soldier. A soldier. A boy. Innocent, really, then all of a sudden. He shot a pregnant woman, Hala, many times. Hala? I will tell you about the ones who survive. The ones who remain alive after soldiers like yours. Let me tell you about their eyes. Their eyes have a look that you do not see in anyone else. They are looking, trying to look far away. They cannot believe themselves what they tell you what they've seen. They do not anymore know how to believe. Sometimes I think we are all held here by threads, each one of us by threads slim as the web of a spider's. To the people that we love, to our children, and how easy it is for someone to walk through our web without us noticing, without them seeing, to wipe it away with the move of one hand without ever knowing what they've done. If you cut a person's threads, they go spinning all by themselves. They are whirled out to the other side of the divide, to a place where there is no one they can touch. There is nothing to hold on to them. They are a long distance from us. Here, in my part of the world, family is so important. Now they have no one. I am no more a man. I am no more a woman. They do not anymore know how to be. They are now two separate races. This <laughs> frightens me. It should frighten us all. They look at us with dead eyes from very far. <coughs> Sarah, I am sorry that I took your husband. That from him I had my child, Mariam, with her headscarf and her rage. I didn't want this life. I wanted, yes, of, of, of course I wanted my child. I wanted her and Alan, I wanted him. I did. 
we wanted he and I we forgot the moment the present that we lived in I forgot the thread connecting me to you we, we had no idea then what would come we wanted to weave I wanted strings Sarah I am glad that you called, Sarah. I have been wanting to tell you this for a very long time. Thank you, Holly. <laughs> Thank me. Yes. I am to be thanked. Not for taking out. Not for that. <laughs> for making mine. For making threads to keep you, to keep us, you and me, attacked. For telling me what you have. Somehow it helps, it does. Good morning, then, Sarah. <laughs> must be very early when you are. Ah, Good afternoon, Hala. Take care. Your country has caused a great shame with this war. I believe that too, Hala. I don't know what to do. Shame drives people mad. So people should take a seat also, please. And thank you for that beautiful reading. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> oh, that was so lovely. So lovely. Um, wow. So I love that scene. One of the reasons why I love Karen's plays is because the women are so powerful, so poetical, um, and often so raw to the bone. But there's a quality of um, of sisterness that often comes through that surprises, that's sort of like, oh, oh, you don't expect it, and then it's there, and it's very, it's both painful and incredibly beautiful. And it's what I've always responded to. I'm feeling very moved, <laughs> as I think we all are. It was very, very moving. Um, so I, I have to, I, I have so many, I always have questions, and I, and I love Karen's work, so I always have questions about her work. But I, one of the things I, I, wanted to, I wanted to ask you about today um, was um, addressed uh, in some of the reading of Prophecy We Heard, and, and it has to do with a soldier, Jeremy, who is suffering horribly from PTSD. He's also an acting student, which is kind of amazing, and, and he comes into Sarah's life, and some not very good things happen, I'm afraid. But, um, but it's this, the ways in which these worlds and these humans come together and intertwine and, and, and feels hopeful. It does feel hopeful for a bit. But um, I was struck by the fact that when Karen was writing this play, um, which was in 2006, or that was when it, it was first produced, um, we were in a terrible moment, you know. But hello, we're there, we're still there, we're exactly, it feels so similar, maybe worse. Um, you know, I, I was really thinking about how little we've learned and uh, moved in terms of PTSD, in terms of what's happening with veterans and other people who've suffered trauma. Um, 
and it sometimes it's just so completely overwhelming. But but actually, what I wanted to ask is whether you feel, Karen, that there's any kind of um, awakening now. If there's any kind of an opening up of uh, something new. I mean, obviously, in the news, there's so much. I mean, I'm also feeling when I was listening to Beekeeper a moment or so ago, and what I was remembering so much was um, Rachel's rage. Um, rage against men and um, and what we're of course hearing now in all the revelations every day it, we're, we're feeling the rage we're also feeling the power right but what I was wondering about is whether there's some kind of feeling of an opening of some sort of um, atonement or healing now that seems possible or different than there was then do, do you have a sense of that at all I, I, maybe not <laughs> I think with the individual moment, and there are a lot of us who teach, and there are a number of us who teach at John Jay, where we have uh, lots of veterans, and I've had veterans in my classes at John Jay. Um, and so I just thought of one story, because uh, I, I edited a book called uh, Iraq, um, uh, what was it called, Acts of War, Iraq and Afghanistan in Seven Plays, and Prophecy is also in that book, and it's in the anthology. Uh, but I taught that book, and, and there was a veteran in the class who could not come to class. He was so uh, traumatized that he could not sit in a group of people. But his therapist, uh, who he was working with, um, got wind of the class, and she wrote me a letter explaining this. And I said, of course, if he does his work, um, you know, he doesn't have to come to class. So the last day, we do projects the last day, and he came in and he stood by the door and he handed me his paper. And his paper was the story of what had happened to him in Iraq. And it was the first time he had been able to tell that story and to put it down on paper. And I have been trained in trauma as well, so uh, I knew that that is one step to moving beyond the story. That you, you know. So I have that paper in my drawer as a precious possession, and uh, it's not exactly an answer to your question, but I think that in individual moments, uh, there is a tremendous grace uh, that can happen, and that collectively, uh, I fear for the country and the world, uh, perhaps I don't know if more uh, than ever before, but certainly a lot. Uh, so I think we go on those moments of human connection and human transcendence, and they so often happen uh, in a classroom, actually. So um, I'm feeling uh, grateful to my students. So, uh, there are three generations of students in this room, <laughs> so um, yeah. And that's really wonderful. Um, I, I also wanted to say a little bit about um, one of the things that I, I wrote about in this book, this beautiful book, which you must buy, <laughs> yes, <laughs> and read, um, is the, the epilogue I wrote has something to do with my sense of, of Karen as a feminist playwright. And, and very much, in, in my mind, in the mode of what Jill Dolan talks about, which is a utopian spirit in terms of a feminist project. And some people feel that's somewhat controversial, especially right now, but I don't. Um, and I, I feel very challenged and also energized by it. Um, and I also wanted to say one of the things that I love about your play is that um, is, has been there in many of the works that I admire so much is the Cassandra-like figure. The, um, the, the oracle, the, ra or the oracular, I love that word. Um, so, I'm, and I, what I'm sad I, about is that I did not come earlier today to the reading, and I wondered whether in the new play there's an oracular figure, and if you could speak of that, if there is, is there? Uh, they're all oracular, but you bring to mind something quite different, which is, um, I, I adapted Krista Wolf's great feminist novella Cassandra for the stage at NYU a number of years ago. And I had the pleasure of meeting Krista, uh, who was a friend of my friend Grace Paley's. So uh, we went out to tea to discuss whether or not she would give me the rights to adopt her book, which she did great graciously. Um, and uh, 
she, we were talking about the wall coming down, and the third way which she and other German feminists and others were trying to find, not capitalism, not communism, but something new, something new, and they called it a third way. Um, and I said to her, uh, the fall of communism was nothing. Wait till the fall of capitalism. <laughs> she said to me, I don't want to be alive for that. Well, she's not alive for that. Um, but many of us <laughs> feel that if we're going to be alive much longer, that we need something other than capitalism. That, that, and the more we sort of investigate the, the connections between uh, ch climate change and nuclear war and, and money, <laughs> power, corporate power, the more we feel we need another way of organizing. And, and, and actually the new play is a lot about that. A lot about that. And I think all the characters in the new play are oracular in their moments, actually. <laughs> Oh, I can't wait to hear it. Two more minutes. Two more minutes. Okay. All right, all right. Um, well, one thing I wanted to say that I and I, and it's so delightful to to have seen you uh, once again, George, do um, Robert. I love that part. And one of the things I discovered when I when I was reading the book, which I did not know, is that Julian Beck was in fact somewhat of an inspiration for that. Um, role, that character. So I, I want to, can you, do you want to say a little bit more about that? I'm so, so interested. the first time I met Julian Beck, um, Judith took me back to the house. They were living in, in that, uh, what is Fort Greene now, in a, in a crumbling brownstone that Harvey Lichtenstein had given the company to live in. Um, and Julian was in the kitchen stirring a great big pot of vegetarian stew, wearing a little um, Indian, like little mini dress and thong underwear and uh, <laughs> and um, I had just published my first book which is why Judith had come to meet me which had a chapter about their work in it and uh, so he I walked in and he said oh I like your book very much and I said oh, I like your book too very much <laughs> and Judith laughed and we were you know, we were in love, the three of us, forever for his life mm. and the rest of her life. Um, Julian was, uh, you know, like no one else. I mean, he, he, uh, he was his own uh, creature that crossed boundaries of, some people in this room know Ju knew Julian, perhaps, and um, he was a great, great, great spirit uh, person. Um, uh, so he and Robert Graves are the two uh, impulses behind Robert and the beekeeper's daughter. Well, I'd love to be on an island with both of those. All right, we're going to stop now, but this was fun. We're going to show you a videotape um, about... Uh,
the private sector is the place to be and not you and the team would have taken. I think you all agree that was a very, very powerful performance. I know that I work on these issues every day, uh, but still, to witness the actual performance, it really brought back a lot of memories for me. And being in New York on 9-11 and experiencing that and you know, the way that our country has changed since then. But watch them scramble, watch them fail. Head against their losses yourself. Regulation is passe. Glass steel in the toilet flush. <laughs> David Abbas's character is an amalgam of, of different experiences and, of, and different people um, and expectations of, uh, that led to, to torture. For example, if you're a torturer and you come home a family man, you know. Um, and that's something that uh, we don't sort of factor into what happens to people who engage in or are expected to participate in um, coercive interrogation, harsh interrogation, torture, call it what you will. My God, I was against all this. I promised myself I never would. You think I wanted to beat it to a pulp? You think I don't know what a man can become? This play is a kind of amazing catharsis of the kind that we need much more of in public space. We need theater. Part of what, going to one of Karen's plays is to feel, and to feel enormously, and to feel about it, and to think, oh my god, that really is what's going on. That really is what we're doing. I lost close friends at the Pentagon. We have tainted you and I. Sometimes, Lucia, I think it's more difficult to survive. I would love it if if everyone in the country could see plays like this instead of shows like 24. I, I think it would do more than a million marches of a million people. I think it would end wars and torture. This play is so important because um, it, it's simply giving a forum for the truth to be told about, about what's happened in these 10 years. It is possible to run a humane facility, my part. Where I call the shots. Here in Baghdad, but not Afghanistan. You saw me at my worst. You have to explain me. Let me tell you a bit about what I do, because it really informs how I saw uh, the play tonight. So since 2005, uh, my students and I have represented prisoners um, at Guantanamo, um, at Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan, which was one of the prisons where part of the play was set. Um, and I think that's why perhaps the, this play is particularly powerful, because the dimensions of the play that are less concrete and, and more fused with fantasy are the ones that really still speak powerfully and, and, and are able to most uh, effectively convey um, you know, what's, what's extreme and what's radical about this historical experience and what's in its full monstrosity. My glove mandatory now for all. Bleep straight into all heads. <laughs> right, loud. These are the kinds of, of efforts, artistic efforts, that, that hit people in the gut. I'm being now brought into the experience, almost as if it is happening to me. And the it is happening to me aspect is so, so important, especially when the people that it is in fact happening to are other than us. Their hair and lips were covered, but their shapely noses and white eyes were available to view. And the physio could see that the slave women came from all races. The play ends with the story of a whistleblower. And it's important to recognize how important the whistleblowers were in the course of the last um, uh, decade. But it's also important to realize how persecuted the whistleblowers continue to be. Yes, I released to the press the confidential Red Cross report detailing the systematic and rampant torture and cruel and inhumane treatment of innocent prisoners at Abu Ghraib. An amazing moment at the beginning of the play when when Tess describes, describes you know, the, the feeling shortly after 9-11 here in New York, we were all here, we all remember this feeling, this moment of sort of strange openness. Maybe now we can open ourselves to the suffering in the world. If this 
could happen, then the terrible thing would be undone. Thank you for that remarkable and really wrenching play. I just want to congratulate you. Thank you. Maybe now we open our hearts to the suffering in the world. If this could happen, then the terrible thing could be undone. Those young men who crashed those airplanes, my first thought, it was really, I felt for their mothers. I, I felt for their pain of having given birth. Their care come to this. Am I wrong to think so? I watched. I saw. I felt the mother's cries in me. Strange what thoughts come. <laughs> and I, I am not the only one. All around me, where I stand on the street, people are full of feelings they have never felt. Who knows why they think what they think? Quiet it is on the city streets. People are busy expanding their hearts. Feelings come, they dare not say. No noise, but the whoosh, <laughs> the whoosh of each one opening up. The city so still, like being held in a large hand. Each one is a newborn. For the first time, such sweetness. We stand, quiet, together, mourning our dead. There is no more terror on the streets of New York. I, first, I must say that uh, uh, you must read the play because there's so much more in this play than, than is suggested. Uh, and I, I, the, I want to make some, a couple of comments and, and, and then ask, ask Karen a couple of questions about the play. Uh, one comment is uh, I was delighted that the that two of your favorite playwrights are two of my favorite playwrights, Euripides and Ibsen. I, 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 you couldn't do better. Uh, and and uh, uh, it seems to me that uh, in connection with this play, but really with all of the Karen's plays, one of the things that they share with Ibsen is that, uh, and I, I want to make this point because I, I, I think it, it, it doesn't contradict, but it supplements much of what we've been saying this evening. And that is, we've been talking about, and I was particularly struck in the, uh, in the video just now, of how uh, relevant to the time and to the questions of the time Karen's plays are. And of course, that was absolutely true of Ibsen also. But, but the, and here's the supplement. People like Shaw were confused by that and said, oh, well, in 20 or 30 years when these problems are solved, nobody will read Ibsen any longer. <laughs> and I want to make the same point about Karen. They're not just about torture or whatever. Uh, and I think that though they're, they're very deeply situated in particular historical periods uh, and, and, and cut very deeply as Ibsen's plays do, then I think that, that they're also talking about, uh, uh, as both Ibsen and Euripides did, human tensions, the abuse of power and so on, 
that alas are going to be with us, I think, for a long time in the future. Uh, the the uh, and I I think the uh, uh, th this particular play. Uh, Focusing on the torture, which certainly is central to the play, and as the video does, I was astonished that Handel was not even mentioned in the video. To me, he's one of Karen's great creations. I, I, I can't say I love him, but I'm fascinated by him. Uh, and, the, the, uh, and it seems to me that uh, this is already, in a very brief period of time, this shows how the play has evolved. That is to say, the play is much more to me about Handel now than it was when it came out. Mm -hmm. Because now we're, now we're living in Handel's world. Mm -hmm. uh, and I find the, uh, uh, indeed, Karen is, is a real Cassandra mm -hmm. about Handel. That is, it's all there. The narcissism, the it's all about me, the, 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 the emotional two-year-old tantrums, uh, even the corruption of language. I mean, it's really kind of prescient, it seems to me. Uh, and uh, the, the, of course, Karen is, is looking to a, a complex of situations, but I, I do think that she has intuited something that, that, that continues to speak in different ways as we move through time. And I'd like to ask uh, Karen a kind of an awkward question, and that is, how do you feel about being so prescient about Handel? <laughs> are, you, are you happy? Are you gratified? Are you, I mean, what, what's your feeling about that? Uh, this is not, well, one would like to write a play so that this creature would go away, but in fact, he came back full blown with Donald Trump, and, and we all feel that way. I mean, everybody who wrote in the book about uh, another life mentions Trump, because although Handel uses a blog, he's constantly, he's taken over everybody's mind space with his blogs. <laughs> um, his language is distorted. He's, yes, all, all the things you said, Marvin. He, he was, um, you know, once you start to torture, uh, and don't resist it, and don't punish the people who started it. Um, you're on a road, and uh, nationally, and we have walked that road. So I think that the torture program, the war, the whole thing, it, it felt as though it had to be addressed. You know? Now, we never let the critics in to see this play. Uh, so it lived a kind of underground life. It had a later production. This is, uh, uh, we did it also with a wonderful cast at Theatre for the New City, and then we took that cast to London. Um, but it really had an underground life, and so I'm very glad the play is published. I'm very glad for your writing about it, which I think is incredibly astute and wonderful. And, and uh, um, yeah, and I'm sorry we're here. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 one more just quick thing. I realize we don't have a lot of time, but I, I want to say something more positive now. I think that's something very negative. Uh, well, not negative about your work, but negative about the world. Um, and that is, uh, I, I was delighted in the last, uh, in, in the last interchange uh, when you brought up the utopian quality of theater. I do think that this is really something that, uh, that, uh, cannot be overstressed the, the importance of the dynamic of the theater experience and the potential of theater to work for a utopian community. My only hesitation as a male would be, I don't want the feminists to claim this entirely. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, I do say, I do think my favorite book on this subject is in fact by Jill Dolan, uh, The Utopian Performative, uh, and this is, uh, uh, a wonder, wonderful book. So uh, I, I, I give the feminists a great deal of credit for this, but I do think that uh, this is truly a point that cannot be overmade, the, the utopian potential of the theater experience. So. Yes. <laughs> You're welcome in my utopia. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't think, I mean, you know, aren't we past excluding people, please?
Yeah. I mean, let's, let's get past it if we are not past it. Let's be inclusive and welcome all comers. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Extreme weather. Extreme weather. Do you want to set it up? Extreme weather. No, we don't need the mic. Do you want to uh, say it? Uh, yeah, well, this is, um, okay, so this is the play that was inspired by the life of James Hansen. You'll see a short video of him uh, when we're done with the scenes, um, but it is a play about extreme weather, W-H-E-T-H-E-R, there you are, uh, uh, whether or not we can get through this together. Uh, and. Um, we're doing two short scenes, none of them including Jim Hansen. <laughs> Uncle and I have no doubt, nor did poor Sniffly, I suspect. A poisonous pesticide already banned by the European Union, but you cannot come. You have more important work. I'm sorry, Annie. Your father needs every ounce of me. Annie, come in. I've made lunch. I shall eat tomatoes from the garden. I made soup. No, thank you, Rebecca. I'm consuming only raw food, vegetables, nuts, and fruit which can be picked, and the seeds shit, or shat, whatever, wherever, so that the source is replenished and the garden grows up again. Sniffly is a gender-challenged frog, as I am a gender-challenged girl, or as I prefer, burl. There may be a difference, however. Sniffly born a male, albeit so-called deformed with a total of six uneven legs, has also, in the process of becoming an adult frog, been feminized, made into a hermaphrodite by the herbicide atrazine that got by groundwater into his pond. And atrazine can do this to real men, lower their testosterone levels, I I'm told by uncle, who still feels quite potent himself. <laughs> <laughs> uncle told you all this? Uncle and I are engaged in serious research. We are working to ban atrazine in the United States. We believe that once American men understand that they are being deballed, there will come an insurrection. <laughs> <laughs> we are working locally. We have made up how to dig a frog pond flyers, and we're going to distribute them in town. This is all really quite impressive. Does your father know about this? No. Papa is far too busy to know anything at all about me. I am a burl by choice. Perhaps. Also, perhaps due to other forces. We, Sniffly and I, have a profound cross-species bond. Hmm. These things work themselves out. We are works in progress, each of us. You hmm. mustn't play with me, Rebecca. Of course not. I, I only meant to say that gender identity is fluid throughout our lives. There's no need to label yourself. Well, Sniffly had no choice. <laughs> you, my girl must be whatever you wish. Hmm. I am 13. I am alternately too young and too old for my age. I understand very well I am strange. I think at 13 I felt exactly the same. And I don't think you are the least bit strange. <laughs> I like you very much, Rebecca. I like you too, Annie. Really, very much I do. Oh, well, Sniffly had better go for a swim. So George the Pond. So we shall surround our pond with Rosemary Thyme <laughs> and Eglantine, Partridge Pea, 
blue-eyed grass. A thicket of sassafras. <laughs> Low shrub blueberry bushes. The red flower called cosmos. And most miraculous of all, this scruffy little wildflower, Tories mountain mint endangered the world wide. Imperiled. Yet amazement on my face, here it is to see, to sniff. Oh. Sometimes I do despair. Why not? Not with you, my child. Not in front of you, I tell myself. Forgive me, child. Care of this land was passed to me by your grandfather and noble soul. Like your papa in demeanor. Uncle, he said. They called me uncle even then, though I had no one. I was sublimely unattached. Had wandered by and struck by the beauty of the view. I had stopped to linger here. You shall be the steward of my land. As far as the eye can see, we shall hold in perpetuity. Should any of my progeny wish to dwell in this domain, you, Uncle, will see the land comes to no harm. No one shall disrupt the mountain top, <laughs> the mountain stream, or the bubbling brook. Your grandfather spoke like that. In those days, nature intervened in all our words. We painted with our tongues. We looked and spoke and kept the land forever in our heads. We walk with beauty, inside and out. And now we rescue Snuffly and his like from the pond that somehow has become contaminated with runoff from a source outside my watch, invisible to my eye. And we bend down and marvel at a sprig of Mount Tory's mountain mint that is nearly all alone in all the world. We have our miracles still, small though they are. Once we walked the land and we were minuscule. Old growth forest above our head, a cacophony of creatures. We sensed our place in the grand design to marvel at the large and small, the sky, the mountain, the honeybee, the plant beneath our feet, to step lightly, not to leave a mark where we had walked. The grasses would rebound, the forest would remain untouched. We would harvest and replace. We would exit as we'd come, gently, unremarked upon.
I, there's quite a bit of realism in the way the fracking and everything is brought in, uh, and on the other hand, what it's competing against. And you have to have a love of nature, or it's hard to um, be concerned about the problem in the short run, because the big, the big biggest problems in this are things that will happen over the time scale of decades and centuries when the ice sheets run out of control. We can't say how rapid that's going to be, although it's looking more and more rapid as we see what's happening uh, around Antarctica. But uh, we are messing with the uh, system, which is let me see your hand real quick. I just wanted to meet you. Oh, that was great. That, that was really good. I, I, you know, I, I've come for a reading of this. Yes, I know. Really. This is so much better. He did come to a reading. Uh, the, the week he resigned from NASA because. Um, the government under George Bush was censoring his research. We did the first reading of the play. Kathy was in it, George was in it. Uh, and uh, it was a huge audience because it was so newsworthy. Um, but the play was a little, uh, you know, it came a little bit more into focus as we worked on it. So when he saw it again, he saw the difference. <laughs> it's been going back and forth. I have some pre-written remarks, but the way the evening is going, I'm not sure if I can <laughs> make sense to, to read. Um, so I have now hearing everything today and seeing other than we earlier, there are all kinds of things that go through my mind. Um, one thing that occurred to me, you know, speaking about um, prescience, one thing I had in my remarks is the moment from Aeschylus, Agamemnon, where the chorus says, uh, those who have precognition suffer terror beforehand. Um, and one of the things that's poignant about, uh, one of the many things that's poignant about extreme weather is that, of course, the, the scientists, the sort of embodiments of modern thought become the Cassandras. And you know, they're waving their arms and saying, it's terrible, it's horrible, um, and nobody will listen and modern science um, has gone completely by the wayside. Um, and so I think that fusion of you as the playwright looking at what's happening and embodying the scientists on the stage is, is one of the powerful threats in the play. Um, and Sniffly is one of the other ones. Um, and I, I was, I, I think to me, still one of the really moving parts of this play is also something that's come up several times throughout is that deep moment of empathy at Sniffley's funeral where there's not only a connection between most of the characters in the play, <laughs> Frank, the industry lobbyist, stands sort of on the outside and you know, can't only save himself by poking fun at what just happened, but it's a really deep moment of connection, and it's a deep moment of connection with not only another species, but a mutated species that has become something else. And to me, Sniffly is also some I thought today he's like Baudelaire's albatross. He's like a figure for the poet. Um, he sings, this, the frog sings beautifully, but he can't walk because he has six legs. So, you know, in the regular world, he has difficulty getting around. But if you can just listen to uh, this creature, um, you will be moved. Um, and that sort of cross species human connection and moment of empathy um, is to me also what then opens things up um, in the play and connects uncle's conservative vision, the, the scientists' work to sort of communicate to us what we should create policy on, what gives us actionable understanding as much as we can. Um, and so that moment of empathy also connects um, a lot of the things that I think you know, run through your other plays as, as well in that 
moment, um, which is deeply human, um, and it's deeply human about Sniffly. And that, that sort of feeling that the that depth of humanity is actually something that is part of the whole ecological web that we are part of, um, to me, is, is, is very moving um, as we witness it in the theater together. Um, so I, I have two questions, I guess, for you. Um, and the one is about, I guess, the political context of the play, since this play was so specifically also part of a moment in 2014 when it was first staged as a run-up um, to the People's Climate March um, in New York City, and there was a sense that this, together with the Festival of Conscience, connects to a really large outpouring of sort of public protests, saying enough is enough in 2014. Um, and the hundreds of so thousands of people who came out were also very moving on the streets. Of course, you know, in this being Manhattan, if you moved just two blocks away, you wouldn't have known that all those people were there. So, you know, being in the crowd, it felt like, why is not everybody here? You know, what, what is wrong with <laughs> the rest of the city? Um, you know, and then in 2014, 15, it was part of Art Cop, very closely connected to the climate talks in Paris. Um, and I, I'm very glad to hear that it's going to be performed again um, in, in March, in the spring. So my first question would be, how do you think of it now? What's the context? Um, because this play particularly was, to me at least, always part of directly a moment of, you know, this also needs to be part of political action of people going out. So how do you see that now? So I think there are two things. One is that when I wrote the play and when it was first done, uh, it wasn't common knowledge that science is being censored. Mm -hmm. Now I think it's common knowledge and everybody knows. You know. Then it was kind of news and the climate scientists were trying to say that uh, they were being censored. Now they are being censored and they're reacting in different ways. Um, James Hansen has just written a paper called Reticence in Science, where in effect he takes scientists to task who don't come out and speak. Um, but other scientists are removing the words climate change from their grant proposals because there's tremendous censorship. I don't think we've had, I've never had more trouble raising money for a play than this play. Um, the city turned us down, the federal government turned us down, the state government didn't, NISCA has funded us a little, but uh, uh, you know, I think it's, anyway, uh, there, there's a lot of censorship. I think people who sit on boards of theaters are heavily invested in fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. um, to do a play that directly addresses that is dangerous uh, to theaters. Um, we're doing it at La Mama. Um, <laughs> Uh, I was told by a very important theater producer in New York that uh, he already did a play about climate change once. Which is sort of like doing a play about fathers and sons once. <laughs> uh, but, um, but I think there's tremendous fear and tremendous censorship, financial censorship. At the same time, I think the topic of the play is common knowledge now, so it's not a surprise. And I think that's good because where we are feeling some of that. Also, um, after we did the play at Theater for the New City, Blanche Cook was in the audience, and she came up to me and she said, I'm glad, there she is in the audience again, next to Claire Koss, another wonderful playwright, okay? Um, two sisters from many years of marching, and uh, other things. <laughs> and, and she said to me, I'm glad you made the fossil fuel lobbyist the rapist, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> And she got it then. Um, but going back to Alexander's comment about the funeral and Frank not being able to participate in the funeral for Sniffly, which is this very moving moment for, for everyone, actually. All the adults get into it except Frank. The, and then he goes off and he puts the make on Rebecca, the climate scientist. And then when Rebecca turns him down, he goes after Annie and he puts the make on the little girl. And I think that this says something about what we're witnessing, mm -hmm. that these men, when they get moved, 
their response is a predatory response. Mm -hmm. And it's not, you know, one of the things we may be up against, and maybe I've never thought it quite this way, is how can people be moved and then go to an I and thou response and not need to conquer someone. They see a beautiful young woman in an elevator and they whip out their dick, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, that's not the response, right? Um, they were moved and then they need to own. Um, and this is perhaps, you know, it just... Um, two more minutes. <coughs> yeah. I'll skip the comment I was going to make <laughs> and ask the, uh, the other question. I mean, that was obviously one of the things that was on my mind. I thought in 2014, some of my students came up to me and saw the play, like, was that necessary? Um, and I think next year people might think that you put it in to be more talkable. And that's the, it's that kind of connection of ownership and the right to own and the right to do with what you own, what you want, because you own it is obviously a deep-seated problem. Um, the, the other question I had was, and I couldn't help but think that sort of Annie and Sniffly, who are sort of pushing the species boundaries in, in this play, were sort of moments that moved you to other than we and questions about transcending current species boundaries in a in a very literal way, so I'm Yeah, happy. for sure. I mean, I grew up, luckily, riding horses. Um, uh, and I always say horses saved my life, and I mean that, um, truly. Uh, and then I had to make a choice because, you know, horseback riding is an expensive hobby. And so I, I dropped it, and I, <clears throat> I went to college, and blah, blah, blah. But in the last couple of years, I've gone, since I wrote this play, almost, um, so, in October, I got to go riding in, in England on some beautiful thoroughbreds. And uh, <laughs> what's happening to me is that my own love of nature has, is coming back so much, and I think this is happening to a lot of people. As we see what's vanishing or what might vanish, uh, and things are vanishing in front of our eyes, we remember that for so many of us, those moments in nature were the formative moments of our lives. And that's what we carry with us, and that's what we go back to when we need sustenance and need to find self. And we find self in relationship to a much larger uh, world, natural world, or 3,000 pound horse, or whatever. Um, you know, uh, and, uh, and so we feel that connection, and that connection is part of self. And, and that is coming, it came to me again through this play, and, and yes, through Other Than We, and I think it's a shared experience. Um, there's a word called solastolgia, what is the word, Alexander? Solastolgia, 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 which is the grief for the loss of what we, of what we know, uh, like fall, <laughs> snowstorms, yes. And I mean, this is, this is also, I mean, this is memory, obviously, yeah. right? This is what theater and, mm -hmm. and art are always powerfully about in poetry and in remembering what is gone already as you still have it somewhere yeah. in your imagination. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So. And can bring it back from. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So you can still can sit there. We're just going to ask the. Um, um, are you going to give applause? The panel. The panel. The we panel. just go We're over right panel. away. And Marvin and uh, Cindy and George. <laughs> I, I really also want to thank the actors who all have been so wonderful.
So, um, since we, uh, uh, I think we stayed very much with the time, and I apologize for interrupting, but I think maybe perhaps we go right away um, to the questions um, of the audience. So, um, if you have a comment um, or a question, please maybe say before who you are and uh, and uh, maybe what you what you work. We're gonna record it. That's why we use a microphone, but we actually also do hear it better. Even so, I thought the actors pronounced very perfectly, and everybody could hear and um, what this is. So please um, do say so. Or perhaps one question, and um, and um, then we, we we just like good jazz musicians, you know, we <laughs> react to it or not or speak something. So. Um, Let's open it up, but maybe Kathy, you want to you want to start with your, your impressions. Um, yeah, a question. Okay, do we have a mic? Um, hi, professor. You know, you know you're um, Yanni. Yeah. Yanni, I take her class. I took two semesters with professor. Uh, I really do enjoy a lot of the work that we go over. I'm glad that you have me here, but. Uh, recently, there's when you spoke about a uh, torture in one of the plays, I think that uh, John Jay recently went through some things with the uh, art gallery where we were sharing some of the pieces from the people that were actually at Guantanamo Bay. So I just want to kind of get your take on that and how do you feel towards that? Yeah, there's an incredible art show at, at John. Have you you've seen it then, Yanni? Have you gone up there? No, I just, I, I oh. wish I did, but I have you have to go up. It's on the sixth floor. It's in the president's gallery, and it's a it's paintings by Guantanamo inmates, and it's called Ode to the Sea, and these are absolutely heartbreaking, beautiful works of art painted uh, by people who are in cages in Cuba who can hear and smell the sea but cannot see the sea. And once when there was a hurricane, they took the blinds off their cages so they got a glimpse of the sea. And these are just uh, heartbreakingly beautiful artworks um, on display at John Jay because of one of our faculty members has curated the show. And the government wants to destroy this art. The US government saying that it owns this art because it was painted under their auspices. Um, so it's up through, I think, the end of the, well, through January, anyway. Um, well, Yanni, you know how I feel about torture, because we talk a lot about these things <laughs> in, in class. Um, uh, so thank you for bringing that up. It's a really important art show. And, uh, you know, we'll just, you know, we have human beings in cages without you know, any chance. And not just at Guantanamo, in our own prisons here as well. We all know. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. To mark the place, yeah, maybe introduce shortly. Um, my, Leah Friedman, um, I'm a writer and I teach at Kingsborough. Uh, the play that I know is uh, the play that George uh, did, the one man show that he did it in my classroom, which my students were so moved by um, because again, you took issues, the two, two of you wrote the play and you took issues. We didn't write, write the play. We did not write a word of the play. Oh, we, it, it, it's a diary of Victor Klemper, I right. will bear witness. Yes. It's an 800 page diary that we Which edited. You, we edited. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we were very, I guess I, we were very clear that we didn't want to ch change a word of right. someone who had such a unique voice. Right, I know. And we just wanted to make it dramatic. I mean, right. give it a dramatic arc. Which well, it's quite something to condense yeah, that yeah. material. Yeah. But um, what, what impressed my students, in addition to the material of the play, was um, George's commitment coming to, you know, to the classroom, but to the living rooms and doing this. And, and actually what comes across to me, getting to know your work a little better um, through this, is taking on this extraordinary vocation of channeling the tr all the issues of our time just channeling them, I mean, that's quite an undertaking on both of your parts. And, and then, you know, artistically working with that material, I, I think it's quite, uh, there are plenty of writers and plenty of playwrights about, but there's something about the consistency over such a long period of time and, and, the, and the, all of the, uh, the um, hitting such major issues consistently the way you do, that's just um, knocks me over. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. 
My name is Judith Weiss. I'm an environmental biologist. And uh, we saw extreme weather downtown. I had heard about it through some scientific group. I can't remember exactly who or what. But I probably wouldn't have known about it otherwise. And I we just loved the play. Um, but I wanted to make a comment about your comment about scientists censoring themselves and not putting the word climate in the grant proposals. This is a repeat of what happened with the word evolution during the Reagan administration. It wasn't that people couldn't get the funding. It's that the political people would look at the titles and the abstracts. So you don't want to keep the word evolution or climate change in the title or in the abstract. But within the text of a grant proposal, that's, it's there. The politicos would never read that. And, and so the people are, are doing what they need to do in order to get the funds. No, so I'm not, it's not really censoring. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not criticizing. I wasn't. Jim Hansen does. He thinks that, and Michael Mann. I mean, there's kind of a split as I, you know. Uh, but I wasn't criticizing uh, people doing what they need to do. On the other hand, I'm a writer, and I do think that self-censorship is the easiest way for people to c control us. And if we so censor ourselves, then their job is done. They don't have to police us anymore. So I am against self-censorship. Yes. I'm Blanche Wiesen Cook, and a great fan of your fabulous galvanizing work. Um, and what we need, you know, is political theater that galvanizes us. And we need, instead of self center, we need to go shoulder to shoulder, hearts open, fists high, into the future. And all of your work does that, and your gang does that. Mm -hmm. And we're just so grateful. Let me just say the John Jay Show is online. Um, go to the John Jay website and uh, O to the C. It's an incredible uh, show. It's, on, it's open on the sixth floor President's Gallery to the 28th of January. I, this is while nobody's raising their hands, so please do in a second. I was just, it's just, just purely anecdotally, I was today looking again at the essay I wrote for your play, which I wrote last summer in 2016, um, and I realized I had forgotten that there were thousand year floods, quote unquote, in West Virginia last May because of everything that has happened since. Um, and, and I come back to the question of memory, particularly related to the environmental moment that we're in. I mean, and also, of course, the political moment, they can't really be pulled apart anymore. Um, we are just barraged by one catastrophe after the other, and we have trouble remembering them if we did not you know, live through them. We won't forget Sandy, but everything else that has happened since is kind of a blur. Um, so yeah, I mean, right now, yeah. California is on fire in December, as it was last year, as it was this summer. Um, and, you know, it just, just passes us by until, you know, the house has burned down. Um, so for that reason, too, putting it on stage rather than on a blog or in a tweet um, is, I think, crucially important to give people a way of not only remembering things, but also increasing their capacity to remember and, and, and contain what's happening. Well, part, part of the reason, I, I totally agree with, part of the reason that, that, that it passes us by is the, the calculated suppression of the concept of climate change by the media. I mean, yes. uh, and I mean, it's a, yeah, I mean, of course, I mean, we have no way of, you know, technically, you well, know. Well, and, and, and uh, while I, while I, I mean, so I'm, just, I'm, I'm, I'm really agreeing with you, uh, but, but uh, alas, the solution is not, at this point, the theater, 
because the theater is even, the theater being a product of the American capitalist system is even less welcoming to this kind of thing than the media is, uh, and as Karen's career clearly shows. Maybe Kathy, can you? Where do you see Kant's work fit in in the in the work of your theater and in in, in American theater? <laughs> you just said there is no such thing, right? <laughs> well, there is an American no, theater, no. absolutely. Yeah. It's just that it's not. I think the, the, uh, I think the. Um, it's a tricky subject, the American theater. Um, from now, from time to time. It uh, rises to the occasion, and whenever it produces Karen's plays, it's a time when it rises to the occasion. The occasion, and um, in the uh, the power of all being together in a room, mm -hmm. all at the same time, all the same size, all listening to the same thing, is unparalleled. And the courage and kind of uh, spiritual cussedness of people who just will do it, no matter what the world does, is what will save us. And Karen is um, at the forefront of that group of brilliant, spiritually cussed people who just keep at it. Here, here. Hi, my name is Joan Lipkin. Um, first of all, Karen, I just want to congratulate you on this tremendous achievement, and I also want to thank the actors that were incredible. Um, thank you all for being here. So, Marvin, I hate to take issue with you, but I need to disagree because um, I, I do believe that more plays, full-length plays need to be done, but there was, in fact, Chantal Bilodeau has piloted a theater reaction about climate change <clears throat> for several years in a row and commissioned five, I think 50 short plays this past year. That took place in, uh, my stats are gonna be a little off, I know I produced it, but um, in St. Louis, but they, it was done in like 30 different countries and uh, about 150 different events. This is not the same thing as having a full-length, full-bodied piece, you know, some of Karen's work, but it is a grassroots movement, and it is a kind of claiming of space in a different sort of way. We rented the Ethical Society. Other people did it in classrooms and public spaces. So I just, I, I, I actually have another comment, but I just wanted to share that because um, there is tremendous censorship in the theater. I think probably most of the people in this room know that, and certainly around this issue. But there are ways that people are challenging formats and structures within the capitalist system of, of, of contemporary theater. I agree. It's just harder here than almost any other major advanced country. Yes. That's all. Yes. I, 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 no, no, nothing is impossible, although as soon as Karen is produced on Broadway, I'll come back to you and say, you were right. Let's make it happen. Where's the money? Yeah. Well, I appreciate that, but my point is, I, I think one of the to, uh, one of the points that I want to make, and then I have a question or a really Maybe comment. Maybe the question, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, just that we need to think in really imaginative ways about challenging structures. My, my question is, Karen, it thrilled me, uh, my comment, it thrilled me in extreme weather to see this non-traditionally abled frog <laughs> and a young transgendered person because I rarely see those kinds of characters which are very de dear to me on stage. And I was wondering if you could comment a little bit about your, your pull to those voices and to that kind of representation. Well, I mean, I do think, and you would, we're in agreement, uh, that boundaries have to be breached everywhere, um, that we can't be locked into uh, gender, race, uh, whatever, you know, where we need to reach across um, 
boundaries. At the same time, who we are is very important, and this has been the struggle, you know, how to deal with uh, identity politics, which is not my thing, by the way, um, and how to deal with visionary politics. Um, I don't know where these things come from. You know, you hear a voice in your head, and it's Sniffly or Annie, and, uh, and there they are. And I, I mean, many writers say this, the characters appear. Uh, I do think a lot about backstories uh, more and more as I write, before I write the character, what's their backstory? Um, uh, that oc it occupied me a lot with other than we, actually, a lot. Um, I think it's valuable. It's something maybe I've learned late, but I, I, I focus on that more and more. Um, and then otherwise, uh, you know, one just, I don't know. I, I always say that the greatest, I've made not a dime from my work. Uh, I've supported myself as an adjunct teacher, so try that. Um, uh, um, but I've always said that, that the greatest rewards of my work are the people I've met, and a number in this room, um, a number, everybody on this panel, <laughs> and, and I feel very lucky uh, to have known the people I've known, to have worked with the people I've worked with, to have loved the people I have loved, and there have been many different kinds of people in that mix who I've loved passionately, um, sometimes not wisely, but very well. Uh, so um, I think the rewards uh, are, have been human, and, and that maybe that's what, maybe that shows a bit, hopefully. Maybe one I last, like yeah, uh, we'll take, let's take the microphone. Just that cherishing, uh, Claire Cause, is, there's a kind of cherishing of life that feels that embrace that holds all of these really difficult subjects that comes out and what I feel right now. It was the performances and the panelists and the feeling in the room here is such a great gift for all of us mm -hmm. to, to go out there and keep on keeping on. And um, I just want to thank you. The image of that starving polar bear that was in the Times just kept coming to me tonight. It was amazing how this love of life, respect for life, is, is just so profound in your work through looking at all the hard things we have to deal with. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any closing statement, or you, Karen, or... Um... <laughs> I feel I've said so much. I feel very grateful and, and uh, to all of you. And thank you so, so much, the people who contributed to the book in so many different ways, and the people who are here contributing tonight. Just thank you. Thank you. It means an enormous amount to me. And uh, uh, just as a postscript, uh, uh, since that feeling is in the room and has been created by uh, uh, this uh, amazing uh, display of playwriting, 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 mm -hmm. which uh, interests me uh, personally uh, for many years in developing uh, new theater. But when I read her, when Karen came with Judith Molina to the theater and handed me a script, and I went up to the stairs to my office, and. I opened it, and um, I still remember, uh, as if it were yesterday, uh, I got goosebumps on the first page. Mm -hmm. And I said, wait, what? Whoa, 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 wait a minute. And I went to the next page, mm -hmm. and it was the same thing. And then I went to the next page, and I said, this is a theater. This play is a theater. This is what uh, I have always been trying to uh, encourage, you know, artists, uh, theater artists, uh, to to realize visions. Um, and but this, the, what's so great and fierce and uh, penetrating about uh, uh, Karen's work. Uh, and why it's so important um, is that, you know, 
it, it achieves theater on the levels that theater is supposed to. Theater is there to create this thing that's now in this room. And uh, that's the reason uh, we go, and it's the reason that uh, we keep uh, doing it. And uh, so you must come March 1st <laughs> <laughs> to La Bamba. So uh, a big applause to Karen. Karen, please stand up. And <laughs> that was all nice and philosophical and everything. I represent the uh, nexus of art and capitalism. <laughs>